Thanks everyone for coming out today and uh, thanks very much uh, for everyone here at Seamer for putting on this two day conference. I do appreciate all the work behind the scenes that goes on in, um, goes on to make something like this happen. And I also really appreciate the opportunity to present um, our, some of our results. So following up on a presentation that you just saw, in particular the recruitment rates of wood to our streams that Dave just presented on, I'm going to take a closer look at the specific uh, changes in wood loading within our streams uh, across our experimental treatments. We're not the first people to uh, take a look at the role of wood in streams. A lot of work has been done in that regard in the Pacific Northwest and the contribution of wood to the uh, biotic and abiotic components of the stream is uh, pretty well documented at this point. But in terms of research specific, uh, specifically looking at the effects of harvest on wood loading, we don't, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we don't have nearly as many examples. I've listed a, a few of the examples here, but also noted how these particular studies uh, differed from ours in really fundamental ways. Um, the Jackson study, which was in many regards really uh, the most similar one to our study, uh, they found a lot that nearly the entirety of their clear-cut reaches were, were covered in wood following harvest, and that resulted in the exclusion of their most severe treatment from their research. Uh, the, the Chen study also found increased wood loads in recently harvested streams, but that was a retrospective study. And the Olson and Rugger study again found increased wood loading following harvest, but they were primarily looking at alternate buffer widths. And a uh, reminder, we're looking at alternative buffer lengths with all of our work with this study. Uh, one more important finding from Bob Bilby, who's presenting later today, and James Ward, is that small wood uh, in particular is more abundant in and provides a greater functional role in smaller streams. Um, and our study streams are very much qualified as being small. And that's primarily due to a lack of fluvial power that would be required to move that small wood out of the headwaters. And so keeping all that in mind, our objective with this component is to evaluate the response of both small and large wood loading uh, with our varying buffer treatments. And you're all pretty familiar with our treatments at this point, but just a reminder throughout the entire day as we present the, our results that um, our treatments uh, appear in the same order from left to right with our most extreme or uh, total lack of buffer to the right. So uh, the first question that we posed to help us frame our results, was there a harvest response? Was there an increase or a decrease in all of our treatments relative to the reference? And then from there, we can ask the question, was there a treatment response? Did one or two of the treatments differ from the other treatments uh, and or from the reference? Our metrics uh, for today for evaluating pre versus post harvest change are the frequency of pieces, which is simply the number of small and large pieces per meter. And then the composition of all of our pieces according to their uh, size or uh, diameter class, and their role in our streams. And then the metric that we added during the post-harvest period was an estimate of the total wood cover over our stream channels, uh, wood that was less than one years old, so essentially uh, logging slash. Our primarily, primary sampling strategy involved 10 meter sample reaches and in this case, we're limited to the main stem channel. Uh, we always sample the bottom or downstream most 200 meters of all of our sites, but then uh, the remainder of the channel uh, we sampled a subset of, depending on just how big those basins were. And for these variables, we, we also conducted surveys for each of two years in pre and two years post harvest. Following harvest, uh, much like in the Jackson study, but to a lesser extent, we did encounter lots of wood covering uh, some portions of some of our streams. And so we devised a, a new method, which was basically a three meter excavation plot. And I have a picture of one of those here. Um, we, we took loppers and saws and, and literally sawed our way down into the stream uh, and conducted uh, as many of our um, surveys as we, as we could do confidently. And the number of plots um, at, within a site was entirely dependent on the proportion of our sample 
network that was obstructed. And we decided early on that for the most part, if uh, part of our stream was covered by wood at 70% or greater, that that essentially represented an obstruction where we couldn't do our standard sampling. This table here shows you a couple things at least as buffer treatment uh, or as buffer decreases, the proportion of our total sample length that was covered in wood increased. And along with that, the number of plots that we conducted uh, increased. So a total of 48 excavation plots over our two years post-harvest and in eight of our 17 sites. <coughs> Data collection was, was pretty straightforward. We tallied all of the pieces according to diameter class and roll. The first table here outlines our five uh, categorical yeah. diameter classes, and then we group those together into the two categories of small and large wood. The five roles that we had to choose for for each piece here in the second table, we only assigned the highest uh, role on this table to a piece, regardless of whether it was contributing um, in multiple ways. And then we group these together into functional and non-functional categories. Functional and non-functional, we now are well aware, is not a great choice of words. Uh, loose pieces in the stream and spanning pieces are, are certainly contributing and inputting um, important material to the streams in the long run. But these are the words we've been using since the start of this study, so I'm gonna continue to use those categories. And I mentioned our, our assessment of new wood cover over the streams. These surveys were conducted over the entire network of the, the drainage, so not just the main stem channel. We basically estimated visually the percentage cover of each of our 10 meter intervals that was covered in wood, and then we averaged those together uh, for each site and year, and for each of the first and second year post-harvest. So we have our average values for all of our metrics, but in those eight sites where we conducted excavation plots, we calculated uh, what we're referring to as a weighted value here. We essentially took our value in the unobstructed reaches and multiplied that by the proportion of our sample length that was, that was unobstructed, did the same for our obstructed reaches and added those together, a pretty simple weighted value for those in those eight sites. And then our general null hypothesis throughout all of aspects of this study was that our change in our reference was equal to the change in all of our treatments. Uh, same linear mixed effects model. What we're really focused on here is that period by treatment effect. And so when we did see a significant period by treatment effect, uh, a p-value that was lower than the alpha value of 0.1 that we had uh, long ago established, uh, in those cases, we then compared each of the treatments to the references and to each other. So for those metrics, we have uh, the six pairwise contrasts there. First, some general results. We did count uh, 190 plus thousand pieces of wood. That number is, if for no one else, that number is for Tim Quinn. He's really fond of talking about sticks in millions. Uh, the total wood count, uh, the proportion of all of our pieces of wood by count were in fact small. And that 80% was true for both the pre and post harvest period. So this uh, relatively simple pie chart here essentially is showing you that as the diameter class increases, the proportion of the sample decreases. Really uh, very few pieces in our two largest size classes. The proportion of functional versus non-functional pieces for each of our categories really only changed um, for our large wood and you can see there that going from the pre to post harvest period, we did see a little bit of a decrease in the proportion of our large wood pieces that were functional. Some of our specific results now, uh, in terms of the post harvest new wood cover, during the uh, first year post harvest, we saw our greatest average cover in our forest practice and 0% sites. And that amounted to roughly 32 to 35% average cover in those two particular treatments. During the second year post-harvest, um, we again saw a significant period by treatment effect, 
there was no more new wood left in the 0% treatments to fall into the stream. And so we didn't have any new wood there. That's uh, not surprising at all. In terms of the frequency of large wood pieces, we saw an increase in both the total pieces and the functional pieces in all of our treatments relative to the reference. Uh, the data in the, these graphs on the y-axis is log transform data. So in a, couple, uh, in a couple instances, I have included what those values translate to kind of on a relative scale. So in the case of total large wood pieces here, we're talking about an increase of 60 to 70 percent uh, relative to the references. In terms of small wood, once again, an increase in all of the treatments uh, in comparison to the reference. We kind of had two treatment effect groups there with the, the small wood total pieces, the forest practice and 100 percent uh, in one group, and the zero percent is where we uh, saw the greatest increase by far, 170 percent more total pieces uh, in the absence of a buffer relative to the reference. And so I have all this summarized here uh, just in one slide. Uh, we did see an increase in small and large wood pieces in all of the treatments, as I mentioned, relative to the reference. So what we're calling a harvest effect here. Uh, I did list small wood uh, in a couple places here as both a harvest effect and a treatment effect. Uh, in the, we saw an increase in those small wood pieces in the 100% forest practice grouping and our greatest increase in the 0% treatment. And it was in the forest practice and 0% treatment group where we saw our highest average new wood cover in that first post-harvest year. A little footnote about that wood cover is that the 32 to 35 percent average cover that we did see in those two uh, more extreme treatments uh, is roughly three times less than the wood cover that was seen in the Jackson study that I talked about earlier, which uh, was very similar to ours. And then closing, I just have this uh, little preview of sorts and I want to acknowledge that uh, we are seeing a pretty substantial contribution of wood, and especially small wood, to our channel characteristics, uh, changes in channel characteristics. And I'll have a, a bit more to say about that this afternoon uh, for those of you who are still here um, after lunch, hopefully. That's all I have. Wood loading. Thanks. <laughs>